You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com and co-hosts, Alex the Viceroy Jacobson from Options Express, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Option Block. We are, of course, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the ever-expanding, ever-exciting, ever-compelling Options Insider Radio Network. If you haven't done so, listeners, I encourage you, run, don't walk, to check out the latest addition to said network, our Options Oddities program, where we break down a lot of interesting stuff, including what fans of this program will like. It's the whole show devoted to unusual activity. I know we do some of that here. We do a whole heck of a lot of it on that program as well. And, of course, you can find that wherever you find our fine programs here on the old Options Insider Radio Network, wherever finer podcasts are purveyed, including the mothership, theoptionsinsider.com, as well as iTunes, Stitcher, AHA Mobile, all the usual suspects. Indeed, even our mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the Fire OS. And while you're checking it out, you can instantly stream all episodes of pretty much every program on the network. And you can also, while you're listening, say, hey, I want to download a few of these for offline listening on the plane or on the train or on my commute while I'm working out. Hey, we encourage that. Go crazy. Download away. And while you're listening, you say, hey, you know, I have a question. I have a comment. I have some insight into that I'd like to share. Well, no shortage of ways for you guys to do that as well. In fact, we baked it all into the app just for you guys. Facebook, Twitter, email, voicemail, you name it. It's all right there for you. So no shortage of ways for you guys to get in touch with us here and make your questions and comments and insights known to your fellow listeners. And of course, I'm joined today on the old all-star panel, starting off by the man beaming in from that hotbed of all things finance known as St. Charles, Illinois. He is Uncle Mike Tusaw from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Broadcasting live from the hotbed. It could not be more exciting than this. All rivers flow through St. Charles. Is that not how the saying goes? Ah, the Fox River does anyway. And that pretty much is the mother of all rivers, so we all know. All life flows from there. Well, interesting statistic on the Fox River. It's drained from the Chain of Lakes in the northern Illinois area around McHenry, um, Fox Lake, uh, th that chain. And the Chain of Lakes is the second most populated waterway in North America next to Lake Erie. There's more boats registered on that chain of lakes than there are in Chicago. So that's a little bit of useless trivia for today. <laughs> wow. You learn a little something every day. Today you learn some Fox River trivia, listeners. It's like the Nile of the Midwest here. All life flows. Forget the Mississippi. All life flows from the Fox River here, at least in the Chicago area. 
<laughs> all right. And speaking of the place from which all life flows, this is not it, but he beams in from there anyway. None other than Andrew Giovinazzi, the rock lobster, beaming in from that heart of all things known as Maine. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program, sir. It is it is it is good. I think though we have while his wait well 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 Tusa might have more uh boats registered and um you know miscellaneous freshwater lakes. We have more coastline than any state in the nation. A coastline or shoreline? Uh I don't know. Coastline. Yeah, shoreline you do not have. Michigan has the most shoreline in the in the country. Are you sure? Positive. It's a trick question that that geography teachers have been telling kids for years. Oh no, we have, think we have, it be we have coastline. We have coastline. Yeah, shoreline. You do, yeah, because Michigan, because they're surrounded by the Great Lakes, technically has more shoreline. Yeah, yeah. Well, there but you go. <laughs> we've got so many fingers here. We. By the who who cares about Lake Michigan anyway? When you got you know, geez, that's not even a comparison. It's full of useless trivia today on the show. Listeners, <laughs> next time you go, next time to go to your trivia night, your trivial pursuit night with your friends, listeners, you'll be you'll be knocking it out of the park. Thanks in no small part to Uncle Mike Tusa <laughs> and his very geographically specific trivia knowledge. <laughs> All right. With the team I assembled, I mentioned we're short of Viceroy. He'll be back hopefully in about four or so weeks, maybe five, uh, depending on what the folks over there at Schwab say, but hopefully he'll be back. And feeling a lot better. In the meantime, we're going to keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the trading block. You know the dance by now. This is indeed the portion of the show where we break down what was moving, what was going on in the old markets, what caught our eyes today. I'm remembering at the top of the show this time, listeners, so no one can get mad at me. We are recording this. On Monday, September 22nd, you're listening to this on Tuesday or whatever day you choose to download it or stream it many weeks, months, or even years down the road. We know a lot of you listeners come in and they discover our archives and they like to dive in. And it's certainly a great place for diving in. Speaking of diving in, the market took a dive today. Most of the major indices off fairly substantially. S&P off over three quarters of a percentage point or about 16 handles uh, trading down to about 1994 and a quarter or so right now. Uh, Dow down a little over 100 handles to about 17, 174. The Q's down nearly a full percentage point to 99.03. And the VIX cash, surprise, surprise, taking a bit of a tick up, up about 1.6 handles to 13.71. So perhaps we'll start there. Senior Rock Lobster, what caught your eye in today's activity? And all the myriad down and red lights we're seeing on the old screen today, except for VIX, which is, of course, the lone green light. Yes, it was probably the like what's weird is almost anything, I guess, connected. I'm not even going to say it. I'll give it to Tucson. Anything connected to the fruit company, I think, was up money today. But everything else was uh, was down a little money. Um, week, I don't know. We got weekend fatigue. We got elections coming up. Market was at an all time high. The Alibaba thing went off okay. Scotland didn't vote, you know, voted to stay in. So I, it felt like a little by the rumor, sell the news, where, okay, all the news is out. So everybody said, okay, they listened to this broadcast. They listened to Tucson say, there's never been a better time to sell your positions in the S&P 500 than, you know, Friday sometime midday. And, and that was it. Vols up a little bit. There's some weekend effect, but... You know, volatility to go up. The market finally moved a little bit. You know, it's just it's a day, you know, sometimes market just goes down. I didn't see any really good news, any bad news. I didn't see any news. So, and that's what we got. I wish I had more than just the meh, but it was kind of meh. Now, I think what, what it might have dragged it down a little bit, everybody's worried about China. At every six months or so, everybody worries about China, uh, which drags some of the emerging markets down a little bit. Uh, and that probably got everybody a little sour and grumpy. And, you know, and that was it. But uh, yeah, everybody keeps saying China's going to stop growing or whatever. They haven't quite yet. So we'll, we'll see how that, how, that, uh, how that all plays out. But, you know, kind of a normal, a little down day. Some social media stocks are down. And that's about all we got. Not, not I, I would... Of course, I'd love to be able to sound a little less meth than I am, but it was kind of one of those things. 
So one of those days, you can't help them sometimes on the street. But you do make a good point. If all of our listeners had gone out and listened to Uncle Mike Tussaud on the last show, they'll be up about a percent right about now. So there you go, Uncle Mike. You may doff your cap in celebration, sir. Well, I said I was still bullish, though, so hopefully they just turned the broadcast <laughs> off before I said that part. <laughs> so you know, today there's a couple interesting things. I, it was definitely a meh day, or is it meh or meh? I, I don't know. But I either way, meh. same thing. Okay. It's a hard word to say. It's a it hard really, word it's, to say than the day it is. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I've, I, kind of, I just noticed that, actually. Um, I, I agree with Andrew in that China did have some bad news coming out. Our people are worried about it, so to speak. Uh, if you look at FXI, the China, one of the China ETFs, uh, it's down 74 and a half cents, or I'm sorry, 74 cents on the day. It's down 1.87%. Uh, a lot of this came last night. Uh, we were actually down about 10 points going into the open, if memory serves. And I just remember looking at the market throughout the day today, uh, we hit pretty close to our lows around uh, 11 o'clock Chicago time. And it, the market just kind of went sideways from there the rest of the day. So if anything, uh, the, all the down news, so to speak, or all the down movement uh, came earlier in the day. So I would agree that a lot of that did have to do with uh, people worried about China. Uh, a couple things to add to that. Uh, we did, it was definitely a meh day in gold. Uh, but the other thing, just in honor of Alex, I have to say it, guys. Uh, what is surprising to me is that today we did not have an update of any sorts in the bonds. And so, and the reason that that kind of surprises me is the fact that we had such the down day that we did in uh, the markets. Uh, the uh, TLT and IEF are only up uh, just very very minimal. TLT is up 14 cents on the day. Uh, so I think there's definitely a lot of things that um, uh, to look at on the day. Uh, I was I had actually sold some puts on the S and P today. Uh, so we'll see where things go. Well, you mentioned your your primary holding, the fruit company. We have we have to start the week off talking about them. They were the big news of the weekend. The reports came out, of course, that. Uh, sales, not surprisingly, fairly robust for the new iPhone 6, over 10 million of the combined units. If you were anywhere near an Apple store this weekend, you saw their line manufactured as it may have been with their quote-unquote uh, pre-order issues on the website. You had to go stand in line because they really hate that when people have to do that. They get all that great press. So Apple tinfoil hats, people I'm sure will be writing in already <laughs> or posting their comments on the iTunes. Uh, but say la vie, it's conspiracy theories aside, it was indeed a, a robust Weekend for Apple moving some hardware and, of course, a robust day from a overall volume perspective. Uh, looking at Apple doing up about 840,000 contracts today, which is a fairly, fairly sizable day, even though it's, it's, a, it's a little bit under actually what's been, what it's been doing of late, which has been pushing nearly, nearly a million contracts a day. But what caught our eye today uh, was a stat from our friends over there at Trade Alert putting out that. Uh, Pretty much half of the volume they saw going up today in Apple was in the weeklies, uh, which is just shows the primacy uh, of the weeklies and how anyone who talks about options, performance, and term structure and things like that, and don't take into account the weeklies at this point, you're really missing a large part of the of the show, a large part of the volume, because so much of the action is weekly centric. In fact, only 20% of the action going up today was in contracts expiring after. October 31st so surprising right maybe maybe not depending on what you see on the weeklies but it just shows how how near term so much of the paper is in Apple so Uncle Mike what's your take on the news coming out of the weekend and Apple of course recrossing the 101 threshold and indeed this surprising or perhaps not surprising news that so many Apple devotees are also fans of the weeklies yeah it's not that, that part's definitely not a shocker, Apple traders liking weeklies. A couple things in regard to the news, I don't think anything was really a big surprise for the news on, um, on the new iPhone sales. Uh, but the thing that I find interesting about Apple right now is it just still is kind of puttering around that 100 level. Uh, I'd like to see it break through the 104 level uh, or take a little bit of a dip, e either pull back or start going up. It's like Apple and the S&P are the two things that are just driving me insane uh, for, uh, for in terms of trading right now. I, I wish they just do something already. Yeah, well, speaking of doing something, we also saw we talked last week, I should say, about the, the big Alibaba IPO 
and all of the ramifications that have happened as a result. It was a pretty much $25 billion IPO. So there's going to be a lot of reverberations coming off of a seismic event like that in the markets. And one of them, of course, was a Yahoo feeling the love as well from an overall options volume perspective. Uh, we've said many times Yahoo, of course, looking to uh, benefit from this deal. Their stake in Alibaba have been one of the things that's really been keeping them afloat and in having any sort of really positive results over the past few years. Now they've divested of some of it, still have some. Not surprisingly, though, Yahoo volume also off to the races at, in the post uh, in the post Alibaba IPO. They hit a record. Let me pull up the exact stats. Today they did 681,000. Uh, but last week on Friday, the day after the day of the IPO there, right in their IPO range, it was 5.4 times their ADV or a record 1.83 million contracts. That's about 35% higher uh, than their previous one-day record, which dated all the way back to 2008, the banner days of 2008. So Yahoo printing on this news and Perhaps not surprising to us here on the show, but maybe a bit dismaying to all of you out there who who followed a lot of the more general financial media and loading up on upside in in Yahoo or in the much uh, talked about no 43, 48 call spread. Yahoo not fearing too well coming out of this deal down about two and a quarter today or about 5.6 percent closing today, thirty eight dollars and sixty five cents. So that 43, 48 call spread looking ever, ever farther out of reach. Mr. Rock Lobster, does either of this surprise you, either the record volume in Yahoo or the fact that uh, Yahoo perhaps taking it on the chin post-IPO here? Um, I have to say my compadre, uh, Mark Sebastian, was a huge fader of the whole Yahoo call spread anything. <laughs> now, did he do his Yahoo thing like he used to do on the show? Yeah. Wow, that's pretty good. Not yeah, bad. Mark, he, but... Uh, I've been selling actually put spreads in there, which has been the only way <laughs> to make money. I, uh, well, because buying calls has been really hard unless your timing was good. The short put spreads and short puts and stuff like that seems to work okay. Uh, mostly because now this is something food for thought. Is the CEO of Yahoo the worst CEO in the world or the best CEO in the world? Real simply because... Basically, Yahoo is only worth the intrinsic value of their stake in Alibaba, I think, right yeah, now. pretty much. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly she got in at the right time. <laughs> but I guess that's one way to see it. the rest of the company? Like Yahoo, <laughs> worth nothing. Yahoo, <laughs> Yahoo Japan, okay, worth nothing. I don't, I'm still trying to figure it all out. I think the hardest part is will Alibaba stay at this, you know, $90 share price or somewhat? Obviously, it was a blockbuster IPI, hugely successful, at least for right now. Uh, even if it drops back to you know 70, 80 bucks, they're still way above the IPO price. Um, and all those people that had to get out, well, gosh, they should be out by now. <laughs> so uh, Yahoo, I think, is an issue. Is it's a, I think it's a very it's a company that people are is confusing because it has. Clearly a very worthwhile asset, but everything else is, doesn't seem to be worth too much. Um, so I think still, I think the best way, you know, this is like a fundamental play. There is, you know, I think there's like $40 a share or something in Yahoo and Alibaba at least with with plus um, Yahoo Japan at these levels That's or, or more. So, you know, depending on where the stock is at any one point, it's still like it feels like the stock is trading for under its intrinsic value right now. So, the, you know, what I always get, you know, the easiest way to deal with that is, you know, buy the stock, sell put spreads, something like that. But that's where it is. And they killed the volatility. I mean, I think it was 60 vol last week. I think it traded in the mid 30s today. Just totally annihilated. It will probably go to 28 when it's all said and done. It's down, but it has, uh, let's see, the low tick for 30 day volatility in Yahoo is around uh, 28. Which I would I would see would be a huge buy. Right now it's around 35. Uh, it's about at the bottom. I would say like at the midterm vol, especially with the the intrinsic value type play and things like that. But but it was for Yahoo. I mean, it, it, the Baba got the value, and it didn't translate to Yahoo really much at all. I mean, I think the stock's actually down. It's trading kind of in the mid range of where it was prior to the IPO. So yeah. just. Never made it. <laughs> were you playing in the weeklies for these put spreads? Or were you out to like October uh, and November? Like, like two, three weeks spreads. Okay. 
I try to go as far under as I could go. When the vol was higher, it was a lot better, but now the vol's at 35. It's not as interesting as it was before. I mean, you could you can go pretty far out at the 60 volatility level and get decent prices for selling some stuff. But yeah, yeah. It's becoming, I would say, after this week, after this, uh, this last roll was a little close because I got close to my short strike. So I just, I got to roll it out another week for about even, uh, which isn't fantastic. But You live in the Tucson dream, rolling puts all day long, baby. Well, I, I mean, I like selling puts below what I think the intrinsic value of a company is. I figure that's a good way to, you know, yeah, there are worse ways to do it. Uh, but sometimes you just got to make sure you just, sometimes you just got to, you're either taking the stack or you're waiting, but that's where we are. Diehard so fundamentalist a, that you are, sir. <laughs> you know, but I know, I know. I think part, yeah. of the, part of the reason that it's trading right around its, its Alibaba intrinsic value is because it's anyone's guess what the hell the rest of Yahoo is worth. What is the rest of Yahoo? I defy anyone to name what that company actually does. They're not really a search engine anymore. They kind of outsource most of their advertising. Uh, they have a, some sort of vague content strategy involving Katie Couric and a few others, but uh, I don't really know beyond that. I what. have not seen her. Yeah, they. I know they, they paid her a lot of money to come do something. I'm not sure if she's doing it yet or, or what it is. I'm not exactly the target audience for that, I don't think. But still, it, it's, it's uh, some sort of vague... This is this is something we've talked about on Yahoo before in the past. This goes back to their having, you know, producers and direct, you know, running their company for a while. They really have always had a dichotomy in terms of what they think that company should be. And they, I don't think they've ever really sorted it out. And someone over there had the foresight to invest in Alibaba and all other things are forgiven as a result. Taking, speaking of uh, the Baba options, I know a lot of you are going to be typing in frantically into your computer right now saying, when are Baba options coming? When can I trade my options on some Baba and they should be, remember if Alex was here, he would tell you that to have caution because they have to meet all these listing criteria before they can actually list the options and it has to make all these liquidity provisions and everything else post-IPO. He talked about that before on the show, so I'll, that'll be my, my token wet blanket role of Alex for the show here. But if all things go as expected, that's a bit of an if, but if all things go as expected, uh, they're looking at listing them next Monday, which will be the 29th listener. So hopefully next time we gather here together on the show next week, not next time, I should say, but the next week we, we get together on the show, we'll have some Baba options to talk about. And I'm sure those puts will be jacked to high heaven. And it'll be all sorts of fun stuff to talk about out there. All right, speaking of stuff to talk about, it's time for us to keep on rolling right on into our next segment. It's time to open up the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, and welcome to The Odd Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down the weird, the wild, the woolly, the sometimes bizarre, the sometimes just head-scratching paper. We're seeing lighten up the old options tape today. And we got some interesting ones kicking out here. We're going to kick things off with a name. I don't believe we talked about this one before. So a newcomer to the Odd Block. These are always fun listeners. This is Cliff's Natural Resources, Inc., ticker symbol CLF. You might think, hey, Cliff Bars, but no, they're a mining company, ticker symbol CLF. Uh, closing today, $12.82, down about a buck 18, or about a little over 8% on the day. So not, uh, not a bullish day here for good old Cliff. And as you might expect, given this pronounced sell-off in the underlying, this is the name that does fairly robust paper. It does about 27,000 contracts a day, so it's fairly liquid from an options perspective, certainly from an odd block perspective, and doing well more than that today, doing 70,000 and some change today, so... Serious, serious paper going up today in good old Cliff. And what in particular we caught our eye, I think you can pretty much hazard a guess here, listeners, given the size downside we saw here in Cliff, was we saw some put activity. In particular, it looks like we got a, a put roller out here. It was what caught our eye to begin with, and what we highlighted over here on the old Options Insider this morning. First up, came on the Nov 13 strike in particular. Uh, the Nov 13 puts, when we highlighted them this morning, we talked about 11,806 of these puppies going up for a buck 27 as the day progressed. A total of just a here shy of 14,000 
have gone up on the strike total by the end of the day here on open interest of 5730 they're a uh, buck 35 at a buck 39 coming out so a wee bit higher than that level we also saw at the time this morning 6000 of the oc 18 puts going up for four dollars and ninety cents and i said yes i didn't you didn't hear that wrong listeners that was october uh, to be precise oc 18 puts so a bit of an adjustment here going up six thousand times no other paper going up on that strike as the day has progressed seriously in the money put action here on the october strike and twenty thousand open on that strike so perhaps uh, some more to go here. It looks like perhaps someone adjusting and rolling on down from the old Ock 18 strike all the way down to the Nov 13s. Is that your take as well, Senior Rock Lobster? Uh, that is it. That is a take. You know what I, I thought on this one is this was when I thought the customer changed course, right? He closed the Ock 18 puts. Because uh, they ended up trading about 12 cents under parity for the 6,000 contracts. Uh, they traded 490, which should be stock around uh, 1310. And I think they were he was selling them. So at the time, that was at least I, I had it at 12 cents under parity. Normally, the liquidity provider does not sell options for 12 cents under parity. Uh, and <laughs> when, then, when they're about five handles your way, you don't really care at that point. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. He's like, okay, I'll give you guys the dime. And then the Nov 13 puts, they hit the bit. I saw the, you know, the clearly, uh, you know, marked a tag, it was tag sale uh, for $1.27. So I think they have a lot of house money to play with on this one. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad feeling when they're five bucks essentially in your favor at that point. When you're giving up dimes here or there and you don't even care, uh, then you, then you know things are going well for you. You know, feel like I mean, it's a punky little price stock. Probably paid a dollar for these puts, and now they're dumping them for four ninety. Yeah, um, I, and I think, like I said, this was a this at one time was a high flying stock. It was seventy five bucks not very long ago. You know, back in the day, uh, it was even twenty something bucks not very long ago. So, yeah, it was fifty dollars uh, two years ago. So, whatever Cliff's Natural Resources does. They are not getting a lot of natural resources out of the resource. That's all I'm saying right now. Yeah, clearly either he just doesn't care anymore because he made his money or he's clearly thinking the uh, the worst is not past Cliff here because he's not just taking his money and running. He's reestablishing there uh, on that lower Nove strike. So that could perhaps be a sign that this guy who's already been right pretty sizably once is willing to put some more money where his mouth is here at Cliff, that the, the end is not, is not nigh here for Cliff. There's more to come. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, unless the company is like on a, a five-year bleed pattern, which is possible, I guess, but you know, the company used to make quite a bit of money. So it's not like that. It doesn't look, and they're still paying a 15-cent dividend. Uh, they used to pay a big dividend. Maybe they're going to get cut that dividend. Who knows? But at least from that point of view, it's starting to look like kind of a cheap company. But as we know, they can get cheaper. Yeah, the book value for Cliffs right now is $39 a share. <laughs> well, so clearly this guy, uh, knowing something we don't, <laughs> maybe yeah, there's well, some off the, off the books the, debt lurking the there or something. book value, right? Book <laughs> cash per share is $2.35. Doesn't sound like they have a lot of, you know, bad liquidity issues, but they're just having a tough go of it right now. Yeah, looking at this chart here, it has not exactly been a banner year for Cliff. They got as high as about 28, 29 earlier this year, actually end of last year. And ever since then, it's pretty much been straight downward trajectory. Just as recently as mid-August, they were trading about 18 bucks. So right. about nearly about five and handles and some change north of here and then just and I, taking it on the chin. Yeah, I don't think these companies do well when there was troubles in China. That freaks people out, I think, a little bit. Uh, this is like an iron ore, metallurgical coal, whatever. Um, and I think like slow down in China freaks people out and they just they crush this thing. So, I mean, that's uh, that's what we got. It ain't too good looking for cliffs right now. But this guy clearly is he's, I think, dipping his toe in the water again in a big way. Uh, Eleven thousand contracts is not nothing. Yeah, that's not, not nothing to sneeze at. Uh, of course, maybe if you're thinking you don't like Cliffs, maybe you sell some Cliffs and you buy some Cliffs bars instead 
and you'll be healthier and everyone will be happier as a result. And you do the roll. So there you speak. go. There you go. Do the roll into whatever that's called, the Cliff's Bar roll. <laughs> I think the Cliff's guy sold his company for like 500 million yeah, bucks. He probably, is ha- he probably is a happy camper. Yeah, that's him doing this right now. He trades all Cliff related, little bars. All Cliff associated <laughs> properties he likes to trade in and dabble in. <laughs> all right. Before we get too much farther down the Cliff rabbit hole, we're going to move on to our next name here. This is IWO listeners. This is, of course, the uh, Russell 2000 Growth Index ETF from our friends over there at iShares. Uh, this is the name, uh, despite some big names behind it and the big index, doesn't really uh, do a whole heck of a lot from an options perspective. Doing about 800 contracts a day. So when we see 3,600 contracts go up, that tends to catch our eye. That's something we would note here in a name like this. And what caught our eye in particular, listeners, was out in the October expiration cycle, one of my old favorites going up for some size today. This was at least comparable size here for IWO. It was my old friend, the bullish risk reversal, the OC 125, 136 to be precise, going up 1,260 times when we wrote it up this morning. Another couple hundred, another about 400 went up today total, so total of about 1,662 going up of this risk reversal. Uh, selling puts on the 125 strike, buying calls on the 136 strike. No paper really open on any of these strikes of, of any note, so it's all pretty much open in paper. Uh, went up in two pretty much big blocks. So uh, not surprisingly, this guy looking for some upside. I'm assuming we didn't see any stock with this, so looks like this is pretty much as it appears on the surface, listeners, this guy really looking to get long some IWO here looking at a chart <clears throat> not a terrible level looking at how far it's been down uh, over the past six months and it's delved right around to the 124 level which is right about where his strike is uh, on this risk reversal and to the upside it's got up as high as 140 so the guy has he's, he's looked at a few charts here clearly <laughs> before he structured uh, this risk reversal what's your take here on our old friend the bullish risk reversal going up here in IWO Mr. Rock Lobster well, first I never even heard of the IWO it's I trade. I traded. I traded all day, sir. You don't trade this one. It's right <laughs> up there with the GWZ futures. Uh, there's the IWM, which trades like five hundred thousand zillion contracts a day, and then there is the redheaded stepchild of. Um, hey, 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 hey! Sorry about that, you saw. I I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, see, two has got red hair. In case anybody on the show, yeah, in case you missed the live <laughs> event a couple weeks ago, listen. She didn't figure that out. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, somebody basically looked at a chart and went, Twing, "We're going to throw this risk reversal." <laughs> That's what it kind of it it felt like to me. Although it did not pass the Andrew Sniff test for, I don't like the long risk reversal when you have to pay for uh, it. Debits, debits, debits are not in your in your free juice book. If you're gonna sell puts. That should be the risk you take to sell the put. You shouldn't take more. You shouldn't add premium risk on top of the capital risk for selling the put. It just, I don't know. That freaks me out a little bit. I don't know why, but it does. Because if I'm not right and the stock doesn't go down, it doesn't move too much. So I don't make that. I may be taking a little credit. But it really stinks to lose money on those when you're short the put the whole time. It's a real bummer. So it gets about a six on the Andrew Savvy scale is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, maybe five. <laughs> wow. Harsh, sir. You, you've yes. said more, better things about straight up upside call buyers. Uh, you know, but they're looking for a pretty solid, you know, bounce back on this bad boy. So um, and it's got to happen relatively fast. So, you know, today, obviously, maybe this might be the only down day. Tomorrow we could have another one. Who knows? But. You know, in order in order to get that combination to perform to make money on the fifty-five cents on the delta, you're going to have some delta. But you know, with the volatility where it is, if it comes in, it's going to be kind of a it's going to be kind of a creepy crawly trade uh, to make any money on the combination. That's the problem. So we will see. We will see where it is. And if it's trading one thirty-six oh two, they're going to be bummed yes. that they did this. <laughs> yes. for- <laughs> we'll see as this person basks in the shame of Andrews uh, wagging his finger at them and saying, no, 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 sir. How dare you pay for your bullish risk reversal? Not on my watch. 
not on my watch is right. <laughs> All right, moving on to a name you may find more uh, palatable, Andrew. I'm not sure. This is speaking of weird underlyings. This one's a good one. A Global X Social Media Index ETF. I have can fairly say I haven't heard of this one. This is Sockle, ticker symbol SOCL, a social media index, just what the world needs. I'm sure there are just a, a legion of these. This one, as you as you may guess, doesn't really do a heck of a lot of paper. About 500 contracts a day. It's more than I would actually expect for a, a name like this. Doing a whopping 4,800 today. I should say we're closed, by the way. It should clo close today. $19.72, down about 2.3% or about 50 cents uh, on the day. So not exactly a bullish day for a uh, Sockle either. And what we saw pretty much came up in one of those. How many did I say there was? 4,800 contracts. 4,585 came up in pretty much one size trade on the OC 20 strike. In particular, it was the OC 20 calls. When we profiled them this morning, 2,000. And 400, 2,418 to be precise, going up for 40 cents. Paper buying as the day went on, about another 2,000 going into, like I said, for a total 45.85 on the strike. So, size buying activity. Uh, surprise, surprise, this is also the only strike pretty much anywhere that has any open interest except for the 19 puts. 10,400 open on this strike. So, it looks like there may be. Uh, some closing here, given the fact that this is, again, the highest strike and the fact that the stock has taken a bit of a pullback of late. This guy may be taking the opportunity uh, to take some of these overwrites off the table. Senior Rock Lobster, is that your take as well on this size activity in this relatively ridiculous name? Yeah, I, we ha I had a conversation with like some of our my clients in the chat room trying to decide if this guy was buying or selling the clothes because uh, a lot of it, uh, they're, they're what we profiled, the 2400 was definitely a buy, where they lifted some, uh, lifted the offer, and that 40 cent offer kind of came in and out all day. It might have been a closer. Uh, the problem is, you know, if that's a closing sale, um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, where they bought it. That means they must have scooped this like in early July or something, because for the most part. You know, we're kind of not at great levels. So for you to actually buy these ox and make money on it with 40 cents, you're kind of running out of time. So um, I thought it might have been a buying to close, which did sound a little, again, that sounds strange too, uh, because of just the levels. You know, if you have... If you have it as a buy right, let's say, why would you be, you know, closing those now? Yeah, you, got, you can give a little bit more time to run, I think, on this one. Yeah, and just kind of let it, you know, roll out, take you out, whatever. But real confusing on which way the direction was on this. I'll be looking at the open interest tomorrow just to, you know, make sure. You know, the funny thing is the two biggest names, guess what the two biggest names in this index are? I had to do a little research on it because then I my interest was picked. Picked, I would say. I'm going to go on a limb and say Facebook and LinkedIn. You know what? That is two of the top three. Ten cent holdings is actually oh, the I biggest I one. I guess that. mostly because I think the rise in the price has been so yes. astronomical. Um, so same with Facebook. Google actually is only about five percent of the index. Uh, so in this particular one, uh, two of the top four are actually Chinese, and the fifth is Yandex. The uh, um, that uh, sorry Russian, you know, internet company. There's <laughs> everything, I guess, connected to Russia right now. Just get it opens up a whole a whole can of worms, too, is how do you structure this thing? Do you structure it by, you know, the comparative market caps of the different firms, in which case Google should be way up top, or is it their share of social media market, which is an entirely different beast, in which case Google should be well down at the bottom because no one uses Google+. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different ways you could construct, construct something like this, which is, again, why I say these kind of things are a little bit dubious because the world needs a social media index you need your you know in your, in your diversification allocations you know you need your commodities you need your equities your fixed incomes and of course your social media it should be a staple core of diversification yeah and what's funny is I, what I, I don't know how long this has been around maybe not you know the year-to-date performance is down seven percent which is very good you know <laughs> we have google tencent some of these other names you got facebook uh, I guess LinkedIn got, but it's getting kind of smacked. <laughs> so you're saying that they own a bunch of properties that have pretty much only gone up all year and the thing's down. The year. <laughs> it's, uh, sounds like another well-constructed ETF, sir. I, I'm, I'm not saying, but geez, it sure looks like that. 
<laughs> now I'm curious. I got to bring up a chart of this uh, piece of garbage. Yeah, I got a high of 23 back in early this year in February and pretty much hasn't looked back. Got his, It bounced off its nadir back in May, about 16 half. So it's a little bit higher than that. But you're right. It hasn't been exactly. You've done much better if you actually invested in any of these names yourself. <laughs> it's it's, it's strange, star. right? Because you think I think the most of the social network stocks have done okay. Yes. Facebook, you may have seen, has done quite well. And Google, all right as well. Uh, LinkedIn even has done fairly well. So to have all of them in aggregate doing so poorly, this probably points to yet another poorly constructed ETF. Surprise, surprise. More finger wagging from us here on the show. And definite finger wagging uh, from Andrew. Uh, buying to close these things when they still got some, some juice on the bones uh, is not exactly a way to, to make him smile upon you. Speaking of smiling listeners, I think you're going to smile because it's time to roll on into the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, listeners, you know what time it is. It is time for Uncle Mike to come on down from the mountains, stone tablets, smoking jacket, and bubble pipe in hand, ready to dispense some options, wit, and wisdom. And Uncle Mike, uh, since Alex couldn't join us today, You'll have to be our, our resident Alex, a resident viceroy on the show. So I think that means a strategy block. One more time. <laughs> I think that means a strategy block filled with all sorts of disseminations on the nuances and vagaries of the tenure, perhaps as it relates to the Bund. So by all means, sir, discuss. I don't think I'm quite at that level in terms of uh, of uh, of a. Uh, of, uh, in comparison and that type of thing, but I'll do my best. Okay. You know, just to kind of add to what you and Andrew were talking about uh, in the uh, in the odd block, I remember a few years back, I don't even know if it's still around, but I remember there was a mutual fund that came out that was trying to invest in nanotechnology. So at the time, you'd think, okay, that's an interesting idea for diversification. But the problem was is that they wouldn't find enough companies that would invest specifically in nanotechnology. So for some of the investment, some of the companies with which we have, for some of the companies with which we're in this fund, I remember GM was in the fund. I remember uh, GE was in the fund. It was all just large cap companies who happened to have some type of a small investment within nanotechnology. And I highly doubt the fund is still around. I don't even remember what it was, but uh, food for thought, make sure that you really have an understanding of what's underneath the cover because you might not be investing in exactly what has been pitched to you in the fund or the ETF or whatever the case may be. Shocking, sir. You're saying the ETF world could perhaps be misleading? Oh, maybe. Is that, is that the strategy block for today? Beware all ETFs. Well, well that along with um, just based on the advice that I get from um, the option pit, whenever you're bullish on the VIX, don't buy calls on VIX, buy calls on VXX. Is that right, Andrew? <laughs> that sounds about exactly right. <laughs> Andrew's, exactly. <laughs> and Andrew's going to throw a sledgehammer at my head now if I was, if I was in Maine. But anyway, what I want to go through today, folks, is just kind of some advice to take on when – you're looking to diversify your portfolio, and let's say you've gotten past all of everything in terms of understanding what you're actually invested in, should you be using mutual funds, ETFs, whatever the case may be. But let's say that you have a portfolio to where you're thinking, I want non-correlated assets uh, because of the fact that when the, market, when the stocks go up, bonds go down and vice versa. Or when stocks go up, the VIX goes down and vice versa. Well, maybe I should combine the VIX with the bonds. Maybe I should combine, well, I want to kind of give you guys some ideas of how we like to look at things at RCM when constructing a portfolio to have real diversification. Now, a lot of time, and it depends on the, the client, obviously, but just a few things to kind of go through with this. A lot of times we don't invest in anything that has to do with real estate. Uh, the reason is, is because a lot of our clients own their own homes. A lot of our clients own businesses that own uh, the land with which they're on or that type of thing. So a lot of times our clients already own real estate. So for that reason and that reason alone, we don't put anything into REITs. Not to say that we don't have any REITs by any means. All clients are different. But uh, when you're looking at things and you're trying to diversify in one way, shape, or form, uh, that's a way with which to consider your exposure and, and your investment. Now, you guys have always, our listeners have heard me talk about gold on this show for as long as this show has been on. Uh, we believe, I believe definitely in having some type of exposure to precious metals. Now, 
with that being said, does that mean that we should also have some exposure to oil, to coffee, corn, sugar, uh, or various other commodities? I think you can to a point. On uh, a lot of times, with what you can do is you can invest in various ETFs or stocks that correlate to the prices of commodities. Uh, if I were to invest in oil right now, I would do it in one of two ways. Uh, I, I'm not bullish on oil at this point in time, but if I were to be bullish on oil, there would probably be one of two ways with which I would do it. I would either invest in oil stocks, such as Chevron, or I would invest in oil futures or futures on the options on oil. Uh, reason being is that I'm not too keen on something like USO, with, which is something we've also talked on the sh about on the show. But with all that, I want to also get back to the main point of today, and that's understanding your correlation. In the 80s and 90s, there was an inverse correlation on oil to the market, meaning as stocks went higher, oil went lower. I remember when I was in college in 1998, I believe it was, I remember buying gas for 71 cents a gallon. Not a dollar 71, 71 cents a gallon. I went to school in south in the southwest area of Missouri in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, at the time, I believe it was the cheapest gas in the country. Uh, and stocks were very high at that point in time because of the internet bubble. Now, in the 2000s, in the in the early 2000s, a lot of times as energy would go up, stocks would go up right along with it. So, one thing that I want to really emphasize for today is that. Inverse and direct correlations don't always exist. That's why it's important to be nimble with your portfolio, not just your option trading portfolio, but your longer term portfolio. If for some reason you're thinking, oh, well, stocks are down, but bonds are down too. How is that possible? Or stocks are down, the VIX is down too. That's not possible. They're supposed to have an inverse correlation to it. Well, not always the case, folks. Now, there's ways with which you can reallocate things. There's ways with which you can make adjustments on things. But look under the hood a little bit deeper, understand the reason why things that are typically correlated assets or inverse correlated assets move the ways with which they do. And that is one to grow on for today. Thank you for that, Uncle Mike. I'm still waiting for my uh, large dissertation on the Bund. Maybe next week? Uh, maybe in about five weeks. Okay. You got to get do some prep on that. I understand. It's a very. I, I was just going to have Alex do it. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. That's probably a better way to go. All right. And with the strategy block concluded, listeners, we're going to keep on rolling right on into our final segment. It's time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. Well, listeners, you know what that sound means. It's time for us to tell you exactly what we're watching for the rest of this week. And we're kind of coming off the heels of a very data, very event-driven week. Of course, we saw a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things afoot last week, not the least of which Scotland and the uh, Alibaba IPO and all the other things we were keeping an eye on last week. So compared to that, this week, a little bit more tranquil, a little bit more quiet, not as many uh, exciting things to keep an eye on. But there are a few. And so to uh, cast our real first to use the local parlance, we'll turn our gaze to Maine and see what he's he's fishing for over there this week in the waters off the coastline of Maine. Wow, we're fishing for metaphors, I think. Yes, I think we are. <laughs> uh, must be the show must be getting close to the end. Um, but the uh, you know nothing's going on. I'm just gonna say it. Nothing's going on. Now Marcus you know why I'm fishing levels. so hard for metaphors. <laughs> I'm I, trying to sell this week however I can, sir. You are. And I think this is like the classic, you know, I think you want to be short some premium. Uh, Volatility is a little higher. VIX is, you know, the 13, mid-13 handle. At least you get something for the options. Realize vol is still low. Uh, even with the move today, barely, barely ticking up to the level of where VIX is trading anyway. And I think we just need a reason to move. And right now, there's really no reasons to move down. And I don't think we've had a lot of really great reasons, you know, to keep going higher. I think overall, you know, you got low interest rates and it seems to be most economies are still growing, except for Europe, which is still, you know, the only thing they do worse than war, which they've done for about, you know, what, 2,000 years, is trying to manage their economies together. So I would... No real surprise there that you got a bunch of uh, bureaucrats trying to decide how to make it all work. So, and as we know, it really doesn't really work that way. So, 
but everywhere the but economies are growing everywhere else so central america south america africa china they're still growing so that's generally good for equity prices and if we once we can get governments kind of out of the out of the mix with all this uh, stimulus that I don't really know how much stimulating it's actually done. Uh, I think, you know, we, we have chances to go higher once that, but it's going to take a little bit for that still. And I think this week is sort of, you know, the re the reality of sort of the fed is pulling out interest rates are going to actually maybe start to move a little bit again. You know, it's making people taking some chips off the table at this level. It's at an all time high. Probably not a bad place to sell some stuff. And with the Fed bail-in, it's just, you know, everybody's going to sit back and reflect, and there's just a little few buyers this week. So I don't think much is going to change unless we have some sort of, you know, drastic, awful news. And the last thing I will say, too, is you got elections coming up now in two months or so, and the market tends to be a little more volatile into the election and a little less volatile after. So, you know, maybe people are starting to move some chips around a little bit, and that's kind of where we are. Uncle Mike, he's using your all-time highs, time to sell. You can't take that sitting down. How do you respond to that, sir? Well, I did tell a vicious lie about his company and everything with which they stand for about 10 minutes ago, so I guess I, I, I probably can handle it. I, I suppose like, that's true. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I agree. There's really not a lot going on this week. I the best I can come up with. Uh, we can get ready for the unemployment report coming out next week, but that's coming out next week. So I think just we're, I, I, I just, I'd love to see the S and P do something already and uh, move away from 2000, uh, either go up, go down, do something. And that's what we're watching. So for just for uncle Mike sanity, S and P please do something move. <laughs> the man's going mad out there in his one man schoolhouse out there in St. Charles, Illinois, just nothing but BBI all day. There's nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't write a book about doing something if the market's not doing something. That's true. That's true. There's no, nothing to do. <laughs> his BBI is through the roof. Your book is done. So it's really this market is crushing both of you. So just for your own sanity and your own self-preservation, I think this market needs to move uh, at least 20 handles in either direction. Give us a nice little nice little bump. I guess I'll just go pull some pull some walleye out of the Fox River. Sounds like it's the plan. I mean, I, I, after all, it is from the place from whence all life flows, sir. Apparently. <laughs> So just, we heard. Just calling it back to the top of the show there. All right, <laughs> listeners, I will wrap up my tortured metaphors. I will also wrap up this tortured segment here of the option block and indeed the around the block segment, if I remember my names. And of course, not a lot to look forward to this week, but still there is something for you guys to look forward to. That's our Thursday episode. It's coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. And before we go, as always, let me check in with each of my cohorts here, my partners in crime on the old all-star panel, see what they have cooking that may interest you. Starting off with you, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud, what's coming on the pike over there at RCM Asset Management? Well, we're coming to Miami. On December 10th, we'll be in Miami, Florida for a panel discussion and cocktail reception. More details to come in the near future. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, check out our website at rcmfutures.com. And Mr. Rock Lobster, what's cooking in the land of the pit? Uh, all I can say is I'm working for the wrong company. They, they strategically go to Miami, Florida in December. I just, there's, Kavanaugh is not a dope. Amazing how that is. works, huh? It's just the, the vagaries of the schedule, just somehow just align. Like, We're going to meet new clients in Florida in the middle of winter. Yeah, they don't <laughs> let me go, so. <laughs> oh, they don't let you go? They just make you work, huh? Yeah, I just have to work. Well, why would I ever want to leave St. Charles anyway? Well, you, you got a point there when you, you got the Fox River and all that shit. <laughs> <on a stay. laughs> um, what are we doing? Well, um, I'm going to channel my umbrage from earlier on the VIX and VXX. Uh, we have a free, free, free uh, webinar on the mysterious VIX and some tips on how some professionals trade the ETBs. That is this week, Wednesday, September 24th. Go to our website and register. Uh, it is quickly filling up. These webinars, I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm not bragging, but they are free webinars. We can, can take 200 people and they fill up every single time. And I got really bad emails saying, why don't you guys have a bigger room? And I'm like, well, that's because we want people to sign up for the webinar and then send me bad notes so then I can send you a note back. 
with a copy of the recorded webinar. So you still get to see it. You just don't get to hear the mellifluous sounds of Sebastian talking about the VIX. Uh, also, uh, surf on over to our website. Mark wrote a white paper with Russell Rhodes, uh, who I think is like the VIX resident major domo in, on the SIBO. Uh, does a lot. He wrote a book on it. Does all kinds of uh, interesting stuff. Saw a. Uh, he did a presentation for our clients last week in Chicago, uh, which was great actually. Uh, Mark wrote this white paper. Go to our website right now. It, I, you might actually learn something. You might do some learning. It's free, free uh, on our website. So we give all this stuff away. And then, of course, we try to hook you for paying 49 bucks for our class for part two of the volatility class, which is October 6th, uh, which, again, most of our classes, people tell us, I'm glad I took your class because you saved me a lot of money from doing something stupid. So that's how we try to deliver value to the world. Good stuff, sir. Free. We can get behind that here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. It's a price we tend to like. And lest I forget, listeners, the Viceroy couldn't be here, but there's a lot of stuff cooking over there at the mothership, optionsexpress.com. No, it's not ox.com. You may want to go there because it's a cool cool URL, but no, that's not their URL. It is indeed optionsexpress.com. You can find all of the educational stuff that Alex is always talking about on the show, as well as all the cool tools, walk limit, and indeed the ever ever popular, ever exciting idea hub. It's pretty much unique in the field. So if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to do so. And the cool thing about what they do over there at OX, and uh, I like to give them credit for this because a lot of firms don't do this or are unable to do this because of compliance. They put a lot of their cool educational stuff pre-login. You don't even have to be a client or a customer to check it out. So surf on over to optionspress.com. Just click around and learn something. You don't even have to be a client. It's great stuff. So check it out. The options. One more time. Not the. That would be us. <laughs> one more time. All right. So check it out if you have a few moments. Optionsexpress.com. I'm sure they'd love to see you. And on behalf of Andrew and Mike and, of course, the Viceroy and myself, I want to thank all of you for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show and for sending in just great questions. We'll get to them on Thursday, and we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. The Option Block was brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.